Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. And please welcome to the stage the chairman of the board of the Air Force Association, Scott Van Cleef. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the 2016 Air, Space, and Cyber Conference. Our last day, but I'll tell you what, we're going to get off to a great start this morning, and we have a terrific lineup uh, throughout the day. I want to mention one administrative note for the last session of the day, and that's our senior leadership uh, perspective. Uh, we're going to have the whole lineup of the senior Air Force uh, leadership up here, and it's mostly a Q&A session. So you're not going to see a bunch of comments ahead of time. So if you have a question that you, uh, you already know you want to pose to our senior leaders, jot it down, either hand it to me or have it ready to hand to me at the very start of the program this afternoon so that we don't have any delays with, uh, with that and we can get going right into it. I'm real pleased now to be able to introduce our speaker this morning. Our speaker became the 19th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in October of 2015. He spent almost 40 years in uniform and was the 36th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps and the first Marine Corps officer to serve in four different four-star positions. Each of you should have a copy of his full bio and the program, and we are very pleased this morning to have him speak with us. Please welcome General Joseph Dunford. Hey, thanks, Scott, for the introduction, and, and more importantly, thanks for all you and the Air Force Association do for advocating for air power in our Air Force. Secretary James, uh, you're here this morning, and, and uh, you've got our Air Force through an incredibly challenging and dynamic period. Thanks for your leadership. General Goldfein, uh, the Air Force is lucky to have you as their chief. Uh, your reputation as a warrior is well known. Uh, the story of you being shot down in Serbia, getting back in the fight the next day is well known. But I, uh, I just heard yesterday, as I was preparing to come over here, the rest of the story, and I, and I understand that each year on the anniversary of you being rescued, uh, you actually bring a bottle or a case, I'm not sure, of whiskey back to the, uh, the unit that rescued you. And last night, I was just telling you, at 2330, as I was thinking about what to say and I was looking at my neighbor, General Goldfein, I thought, you know, at some point, he's not flying combat operations anymore, but at some point in the next four years, he's actually going to need to be rescued. And, uh, it, no, you are, you are. <laughs> and, but when you do, I want you to call me first. And, uh, and, I, and I want you to know, I'm not hot Carlisle, I don't drink scotch. Irish whiskey Middleton uh, would be, is, my, is my preference. Uh, Larry Spencer's here, uh, my old wingman from the, from the Vice Squad. In fact, Hawk is here as well. Uh, my old uh, wingman from the uh, vice squad, Larry, you're out there somewhere. Thanks for your leadership. It was good to see you this morning. And to the airmen in the room, uh, I'm a few days late, but happy belated birthday. Uh, thanks for fighting, flying, and winning for the last 69 years. And if you're an airman, give yourself a round of applause. I'm having a hard time seeing, but Joe, I see you out there, and, and John, and so forth. So for all the senior leadership that's, that's gathered here this morning, I won't recognize you all by name, but it's great to join you. Hey, you would expect me to say that it's an honor to be here, and, and, and it is, and I mean that sincerely. And, and probably more importantly, I'm humbled every day to represent the airmen that are in the audience, as well as the other 200, 2 million uh, soldiers, sailors, and Marines that are in the, the joint force. This morning, what I thought I would do is just share some perspectives on how I see the strategic landscape, but probably more importantly, talk a little bit about what I believe the implications are for the joint force based on the current strategic landscape. And then in the process of doing that, maybe just share with you a few thoughts that I have from an outside looking in view uh, of the United States Air Force. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about, about the readiness of the joint force today. You know, this week you've been spending a lot of time discussing our challenges as a nation and the challenges that you face as an Air Force. And the chief last week testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee with the other chiefs on readiness. 
And, and, and I would say when we gather at venues like this and when we testify before the Senate Armed Services Committee, it's absolutely appropriate that we do so with candor. And I, and I want to tell you up front that I fully associate myself with the comments that the Chief made before the Senate Armed Services Committee and the other Chiefs, and, and, uh, and I'll have the opportunity to reinforce those as soon as tomorrow morning. So I, I look forward to that. Uh, that said, and in all candor, I think there's something we need to make sure we're clear on, and that is that the Joint Force, to include your Air Force, is the most capable professional military force in the world. We can defend the nation. We can meet our alliance responsibilities. And I'm confident that we maintain a competitive advantage over any potential adversary. And I, I think that's an important point that, you know, again, in all of the discussion about readiness, that should not be lost. That point should not be lost on our enemies, on our allies, or more importantly, on the men and women of the Joint Force. They should not forget that that is the case. We today maintain a competitive advantage. All of the discussions we're having are about making sure we maintain that competitive advantage in the future. All the discussions we're having are about making sure that in the future, no soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine ever finds themselves in a fair fight. That's what this discussion and dialogue is all about. It's not about we're broke. It's not about we don't have a competitive advantage. It's about the standards that we set for ourselves, which are incredibly high. And I say that fully appreciative of the fact that all the services are feeling the effects of an unstable fiscal environment over the last few years in an incredible operational tempo. And it's true, particularly true in an Air Force, and, and I reflected on that in preparing to come over here, it's particularly true in an Air Force that really has not seen uh, anything but combat operations since Desert Storm. I don't think, I was trying to think about it, I don't think there's been a break since 1991 with airmen actually in harm's way. And today, we still have, and you all know this, uh, we still have units that are deploying at a one-to-one -one deployment to dwell ratio. I was reminded of that uh, recently in a visit to Djibouti, and I had a bunch of personal recovery airmen and had them in a school circle and was talking to them a little bit, and I said, hey, when was your last deployment? They said it was uh, four months ago. I said, well, how long, wait a minute, how long is the deployment you're on? Four months. How long were you home? Four months. How long was your deployment before that? four months. They're on a repetitive cycle of four-month deployments, no end, no end to that in sight. And then last week, uh, I was out in Yokosuka, Japan, and I went aboard one of our Arleigh Burke guided missile destroyers, the USS Barry. And over the past year, they've been underway 70 percent of the time, 70 percent of the time. And when you think about the maintenance and training requirements that are ongoing between uh, periods at sea, they're running pretty hard, much like those personal recovery airmen and many other many other specialties in a joint force that when they're home, they're running probably just as hard as when they're deployed because they're getting ready for the next deployment, or they're trying to train in some other skill sets that they haven't had an opportunity to train for either during their pre-deployment training previous or during a combat operation. And, I, and, I, and, and as much as I would want to make an opening comment about the strength of the force, I understand that that puts stress on our people and our families, and there are associated trends with that op tempo in that fiscal environment that absolutely concern me. For example, you're all familiar with one of the challenges we have in retaining pilots, and I'm sure the Chief and the Secretary spoke about that this week. Just in the Air Force, we're 700 short uh, this fiscal year, and, and from my perspective, when I look at the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps with fixed-wing pilots, you know, it's almost a perfect storm. Unrelenting operational tempo, the airlines are hiring, we've got an improved economy, and we have degraded readiness in home station. And then pilots are flying fewer hours, which actually chips away at how they feel about being an airman and how they look at the future and whether or not they want to decide to stay airmen. And, uh, and those are things that we have to, have to actually be attentive to. Our equipment is also showing signs of wear and tear. You know, we all know we've exceeded the miles on our vehicles, the hours on our aircraft, and the readiness challenges have been exacerbated by delays in some of the major programs that we have, the F-35, the nuclear enterprise, certainly one familiar to, to airmen. So I understand that we can't be complacent about today's competitive advantage. We have to restore our readiness, and that means recruiting and retaining the right number of high-quality people, modernizing the force, delivering quality training, and catching up on the maintenance of some of our infrastructure that has been neglected for many years. Doing all that is going to require making hard choices. It's going to require that we adapt the force that we have today to meet today's requirements, but probably as importantly and maybe more importantly, it's going to require that we innovate, we, we identify disruptive ways
to do things uh, in the future. In the end, we have to develop and maintain what, what I describe as comprehensive joint readiness. And for me, this is actually deliverable for all of us in the joint force. We've got to deliver viable military options to the National Command Authority during a crisis or a contingency. And we've got to maintain the flexibility to be able to transition from one crisis or contingency to another across the range of military operations. And again, we have to ensure that our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines don't ever find themselves in a fair fight. That's our collective responsibility, and with your help, that's actually what I'll focus on for the rest of my tenure uh, as the chairman. I think most people here have, have heard the oft-used quote now by Henry Kissinger that today we find ourselves in the most volatile and complex security environment since World War II. And uh, after it's just about 12 months uh, as the chairman, you're not going to get an argument from me about Henry Kissinger's quote. I certainly have seen that. You know, although the institutions and the structures that have underpinned the international order for the last several decades remain largely intact, the United States is now confronted by simultaneous challenges in Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremism. And most of you have heard these referred to collectively as the four plus one. And we use that four plus one as a tool when we plan, when we assess risk, and when we make program recommendations. And that's not to suggest that I think that the four plus one is predictive. If I have learned anything in my time at uniform, in uniform, it's, it's, it's the need to be humble about our ability to predict the future. But I, but I have found that looking at the four challenges, really more properly looking at those four challenges as a lens through which to look at the joint force is, is useful. And it can actually answer one of the questions we always ask, which is ready for what? ready for what? I think looking through that lens will help us answer that question. It can also inform our assessment of the joint capabilities and capacities that we have in the inventory uh, today, the joint inventory today, and the inventory that we will require in the future. So for me, I, I think I find 4 plus 1 to be a useful benchmark. And my assumption, and this is important, and if during the question and answer period you don't actually believe this assumption, you have to challenge me on it. My assumption is that if we take a look at those four plus one and we build joint capabilities and capacities that can deal with the challenges associated with those four plus one or some combination thereof, in the future we will find ourselves with a competitive advantage against any adversary. So as we, again, as we start to look at trends and capability development in those four plus one, we look at the current capabilities they have, we look at their organizational structure, and we look at the scenarios under which we might find ourselves confronting those four plus one, I think we'll be close to getting it right, even with a recognition that where we fight in the future may not have anything to do with those four plus one, if past this prologue. Let me start a little bit with Russia. Uh, the Russian military, from my perspective, does present the greatest array of threats to our interests. And despite their demographic and economic challenges, they've made significant investments in their military capabilities. They're also operating with a frequency and in areas that we really haven't seen for over two decades. And over the past few years, we've seen Russia modernize existing systems that pose a direct threat to the United States and our allies. These include long-range conventional strike and nuclear capabilities. Russia is also focused on developing robust cyber, space, electronic warfare, and undersea capabilities. In my judgment, their, operation, their operational capability and their capability development coupled with innovative doctrinal and strategic approaches are designed to do something that's pretty clear to me. They're designed to undermine the alliance, uh, the NATO alliance, and they're under, uh, designed to undermine the ability of the United States and NATO to project power. In the Pacific, you know, our policy is to seek ways to cooperate with China. But from a military perspective, we're watching the militarization of the South China Sea and the expanding presence of China outside of Asia. And while China's intentions and budget are traditionally opaque, very difficult to see exactly where they're headed, it's pretty clear to me that Chinese leadership has embarked on a significant program to modernize the nuclear enterprise, as well as their power projection, space, cyber, ballistic missile, and air defense capabilities. Similar to Russia, China seeks to limit our ability to project power and to undermine the credibility of our alliances in the Pacific. And just as an aside, when, when the chiefs and I went through kind of the process of discovery over the past year to develop the national military strategy that I'll speak about uh, later, you know, we talked about centers of gravity. And I think now from our collective perspective, 
uh, our center of gravity as a nation really is our alliance and partner structure that's been built up over the last 70 years at the strategic level. And at the operational level, it's our ability to project power. So those two things, in my judgment, are, are those that we draw our strength from, our alliance and partner structure and our ability to project power. And again, I've just talked about China and Russia, and from my perspective, what they're focused, they recognize that as well as we recognize that fact, and they're focused exactly on that as they, as they conduct capability development in their operational activity. North Korea's uh, unpredictable behavior and capability development also continues to threaten allies and, and potentially the homeland, and, and many of you in this room know that well. And we've all seen the recent efforts to develop cyber capabilities, ballistic missile capabilities, and developments in a nuclear program. Uh, it's consumed an awful lot of time, I think, fair to say, of senior leadership's, uh, senior leadership's time over the past few weeks. The Iranian regime aims to establish itself as the dominant regional power in the Middle East. And, uh, and what I, when I talk about Iran, I say, hey, their major export is actually malign influence. And, uh, and they're doing that as they modernize, uh, you know, a broad array of maritime, ballistic missile, space, cyber, and cruise missile capabilities. And finally, we continue to grapple with the challenge of trans-regional violent extremism, and that includes ISIL, Al-Qaeda, and all the associated movements. And, of course, our primary effort in the recent months has been against core ISIL in Iraq and Syria. Let me just take a, just a minute to, to maybe provide a perspective on the current fight against core ISIL. And I suspect many of you are familiar with the, the nine lines of operation that, that constitute our national strategy, and they cover areas from governance, intelligence, finance, messaging, and foreign fighters. So the full range of issues that would have to be addressed. Well, there's a military dimension to all nine lines of effort in our national strategy. There's two specific areas that we have the lead on. The first is strikes to kill ISIL leadership and fighters, degrade their military capabilities, interdict their lines of communication, and get after their resources. And the second is to develop effective partners on the ground and support their ability to secure ISIL-held terrain. Conceptually, the campaign is designed to put simultaneous pressure on ISIL across Iraq and Syria. Uh, and of course, Syria presents for us the most difficult challenge. Success in Syria is going to require us to work with our Turkish partners to secure the Syrian-Turkish border. It's going to require us to work with vetted Syrian opposition forces who are willing to fight ISIL. And we're also, at the same time, striking core ISIL's command and control, their sources of revenue, disrupting, and this is important because it's our number one priority, disrupting their ability to plan and conduct attacks against the homeland, which is the number one, our number one focus. With coalition support and our partners on the ground, the Syrian Democratic Forces, we've been successful in taking back a large amount of territory uh, from ISIL over the past year. And in recent months alone, the SDF's operations in Shaddadi and most recently in Manbij have really cut the line of communications between Raqqa in Syria and Mosul in Iraq, and also, in a, as importantly, eliminated one of the critical nodes for foreign fighters and the flow of resources into and out of Syria, again, related to that external threat, which is our primary focus. Over time, the size of the Syrian Democratic Forces and the number of Arabs in those forces have grown. And for those who don't watch it very closely, the Syrian Democratic Forces, largely, an Arab for, largely a Kurdish force of about 30,000, and we have about 14,000 Arabs now that are associated with that force. To put that in some perspective, last year at this time, we probably had a few hundred uh, vetted, Syrian opposition on the, uh, vetted Syrian opposition forces on the ground that we were supporting. So there's been a significant growth, 30,000 Arabs, 14,000 Arabs associated with them, and then 2,000 more vetted Syrian opposition that are actually working with us and the Turks along the Turkish-Syrian border. So the size of the force has grown, and we're going to try to grow it even more, even as we balance Turkish concerns about our support for the Syrian Democratic Forces. With respect to Russian activity in Syria, uh, there's absolutely no doubt that that has complicated things, and Russia has put itself in a position to actually influence the eventual political solution. And needless to say, recent events uh, have complicated the situation with regard to Russia, and I suspect many in this room, the chief included, will be working hard on that uh, over the next few days. Uh, to say that, you know, I, I, uh, I had a group of uh, chiefs of defense in, in uh, Berlin on Monday to talk about the counter ISIL campaign, and I said, you know, if, if we were tasked to lock ourselves in a room all day 
and develop uh, a complicated scenario, a complicated pol political military scenario, I don't think we would have had the imagination to come up with uh, the serious scenario and the complications that we're dealing with as we, as, we, as we deal with ISIL in Syria. But on balance, I would say the pressure we put on ISIL in Syria has degraded their capabilities, it's reduced the territory they hold, it's limited their freedom of movement and reduced their resources. And probably, most importantly, I believe we have started to chip away at the narrative, the narrative of inevitable success, uh, the narrative of a caliphate. Much more work to be done. A focus now in Syria is, to, is, to, is operations in Raqqa, which is decisive terrain for the physical caliphate and really the one remaining critical node for external operations inside of Syria. In Iraq, the situation, as you well know, is complicated by the political landscape, sectarianism, and Iranian influence. And success there is going to require that we continue to develop Iraqi and Kurdish security forces and enable their operations with intelligence, advisors, logistics, and combined arms support. While mindful of the complex challenges that we face in Iraq, I mean, I'm encouraged by the growth of Iraqi security forces, the growth of the Peshmerga, and their success in places over the last year in places like Ramadi, in Fallujah, in the western Anbar province, and more recently in the area that surrounds Mosul. They've, they've, they've actually gained a significant amount of momentum. And to me, those operations actually are indicative of what's in the art of the possible. Moving forward, and I think you've seen this in the media, and some of you are either just returning from a deployment, perhaps, or going on deployment, uh, we fo we're focused on Mosul. And, and just as an aside, we assess today that uh, the Iraqis will have, in early October, all the forces marshaled, trained, fielded, equipped, that are necessary for operations in Mosul. And the timing of that operation now is really just a function of a political decision by Prime Minister Abadi. And we will be in a position to provide whatever support, whatever reinforcement uh, those forces uh, need in order to be successful. And again, I guess I'd wrap it up by saying I think it's indisputable that over the past year we have gained the momentum, we have taken back significant territory, we have limited the enemy's freedom of movement, we have been, been able to get after some of the leadership, and we have chipped away at their resources. You know, there's many reasons why I can tell you that we've had success over the past year, but it's worth noting, and, and I say this not to pander to the crowd, but it's worth noting that the critical enabler of the counter ISIL strategy has been air power. Since 2014, airmen have provided air interdiction, ISR, close air support, humanitarian assistance, and global reach to the campaign. It's been air power that has had the most devastating effect on the leadership, resources, and freedom of movement of ISIL. And it's also been the most important factor in supporting our partners on the ground. But victory in Raqqa and Mosul uh, won't be the end. Uh, figuratively speaking, it's the day after Mosul and the day after Raqqa that actually makes the difference. And, of course, that's, that's, a fig that's figuratively speaking for we're not going to be successful in defeating ISIL in either location unless the basic issues of governance are addressed. That, that will be how ISIL is defeated in the end in Iraq and Syria. But, but we will have done our part on, on the, for the military to set the conditions where that can take place. And, of course, we still have to deal with ISIL and other transregional threats uh, from, from Southeast Asia to West Africa. And as you know, again, many of you involved in that, we do have forces deployed in West Africa. Uh, we're currently supporting operations in Libya. We have forces deployed conducting counter-violent counter, uh, extremist operations in East Africa, uh, as well as Afghanistan. And we're doing a significant amount of partnership capacity building in Southeast Asia. So the joint force, I, I mentioned the counter-ISIL fight to give you an update. That's front page above the fold. But the joint force is clearly decisively engaged in dealing with violent extremism. It is a transregional threat, and we are globally deployed to deal with that transregional threat. The, uh, the challenge of violent extremism and those four state threats challenges that I mentioned earlier have a number of implications for the joint force. The first implication, in my view, is foundational, and that is we need a balanced inventory of capabilities with sufficient capacity that allows us to defeat and deter potential adversaries across the range of military operations. As a nation that, by definition, has to think and act globally, we don't have the luxury between choosing between a force that can fight ISIL and one that can deter and defeat a peer competitor. Nor do we have the luxury of choosing between meeting our current operational requirements and developing the capabilities that we need to meet tomorrow's requirements. And I think getting that balance right, getting that balance between meeting our current requirements and our future requirements will, frankly, define for all of us the next few years and probably one of the more important non-operational challenges that we have as a team. 
In this crowd, I don't really have to say much about fiscal uncertainty, and I suspect that's been the topic of discussion here over the last couple of days. And, and I guess what I'd say is the Bipartisan Bud Budget Act, it might get us through FY17, but we still have $100 billion of sequestration looming. And, and again, to airmen, I don't have to talk about the bow wave of modernization requirements that, uh, that confront us in the future. And we also have those readiness challenges I mentioned earlier in each of the services, and particularly in the Air Force, that are going to take some years to address. And I think predictable and, uh, and sufficient funding is going to be important. And look, I'll carry that message tomorrow to the Senate Armed Services Committee, and, uh, and the Chief carried it last week. But we're going to have to do more than buy hardware to get out of the trough that we're in. We're going to have to expend some intellectual capital and develop disruptive, innovative ways to meet our requirements. And the example that I use when I go around, I say, you know, since 2003, we have increased the ISR capability capacity available to the combatant commanders by 1,200 percent. Since 2007, we've increased the numbers of ISR platforms over 600 percent. And today, when we sit around with the operations deputies, the J3s of the world, and the combatant commanders, we're meeting somewhere less than 30 percent of their ISR requirements. That is a challenge we cannot buy our way out of. And, uh, and I think we're going to have to think really hard about how do we collect, how do we analyze, and how do we disseminate information at the tactical, operational, and strategic level to feed decision making. The problem we're confronted with is not how can we afford to buy more predators. The problem we're confronted with is not how do we expand the enterprise as we know it. The problem we're confronted with is making decisions and ensuring that our leadership and our, and our airmen have the information that they need to make decisions. So we just need to make sure as we, as we, look, as we go forward and we start thinking about prioritizing and allocating resources that we're actually shooting on the right target. And again, to me, shooting on the right target is decision making, not more preds. And I, and I hope that is music to the ears of our airmen because, again, we've come to you time and time again to increase capacity. We'll increase 30 more caps, I think, across this, this uh, fit up. That'll take us from 60 to 90. And so then we'll be at 34 percent of what the combatant commanders say they need. Secretary James, I don't, I don't think that's probably the path that we want to that we want to be on. There's a lot of other examples, and I guess my real point is that the path we're on is not going to get us there. And to paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of money. We have to think. A second implication is the need for us to consider how to most effectively use the military instrument of national power to address today's challenges. You know, I believe we need to develop more effective methods to what we've seen of Russian behavior in Crimea, the Ukraine, and Georgia, what we've seen of China in the South and East China Sea, what we see out of Iran across the Middle East. Each of those nations in different ways, you know, fully leverages economic coercion, political influence, unconventional warfare, information operations, cyber operations to advance their interests. And they do it in a way that they know we don't have an effective response. And, uh, and I refer to that dynamic as adversarial competition with a military dimension short of armed conflict. I'll say it again, just adversarial competition with a military dimension short of armed conflict. I describe it that way not as gray zone or hybrid because those words all have baggage. The fact of the matter is I'm trying to zero in again on what exactly are we seeing. And we are involved in adversarial competition with those state actors. There's a military dimension to that adversarial competition, but they, unlike us, are able to integrate the full range of capabilities that their states possess to advance their interests. And again, they're doing it in a, in a way that kind of mutes our response. Our traditional uh, approach, where we're either at peace or at war, is insufficient to deal with that dynamic. And for that reason, I don't, I don't find the, the current phasing construct that we have in our operations plans particularly useful because that causes us to bend certain activities, certain authorities, and certain capabilities uh, in, in a way that reflects that we're either shaping or we're fighting. And, uh, and I think uh, at, least, at least the chief was probably around last year when we had all the combatant commanders assembled uh, down at Quantico for uh, just kind of a review of where we are globally. And at the time, General Breedlove was still the commander of the European Command. And I said, Phil, uh, what phase are you in in UCOM right now? You know, and he kind of looked at me and, and he said, uh, well, we're in phase zero. And I said, what phase do you think Russia is in right now? And he paused and he said, well, they're probably in two or two and a half. 
And then, you know, I asked Admiral Harris the same question. And uh, I said, what phase do you think China is? And he said, well, they're probably in about phase two. And so my question is, how long can our adversaries that are competing with us be at phase two or two and a half, and we remain at phase zero before we find ourselves at a pretty significant uh, disadvantage from a posture perspective? I think we also, and clearly, again, this crowd knows, we need to develop a more effective uh, framework within which to deter cyber attacks, attributing threats, managing escalation, and, and probably as importantly, hardening ourselves against cyber attacks are all issues that require more work. One of the most, uh, to me, significant implications uh, of all that I've spoken about today is that any future conflict is going to be uh, transregional, multi-domain, and multifunctional. And I think that's a marked change from how we fought in the past. Information operations, cyber activities, space operations, and ballistic missile technology are all part of what has fundamentally changed, in my view, the character of war in the 21st century. And we're going to see such capabilities fielded by both state and non-state actors, and they're going to look for ways to harness those capabilities in a way that exploits our vulnerabilities. Conflicts are going to quickly spread across combatant command geographic boundaries and domains. And the current fight against violent extremism is an example of a transregional threat. But if you consider just for a minute North Korea, I think that really highlights the point I'd want to make. You know, back in the 1990s, we had a regional strategy. And we, made it, we had an assumption that if there was a conflict on the Korean Peninsula, it would probably be isolated to the Korean Peninsula. And we would deal with it with air power, we would deal with it with ground forces, but we could contain the conflict to, to the Korean Peninsula. Then the North Koreans developed ballistic missile technology that began to threaten their neighbors. And of course, over time, they developed not only ballistic missile technology, but intercontinental ballistic missile technology, cyber capabilities, trying to develop anti-space capabilities. And very quickly, I think you can see that a conflict in the Korean Peninsula would very quickly involve General Brooks on the peninsula, Admiral Harris, the commander of the Pacific Command, General Robinson, uh, our commander of Northern Command, uh, Admiral Haney, Strategic Command, Admiral Rogers, Cyber Command, and that's just the joint commanders. Uh, you know, General Hyten sitting here, he certainly would be engaged in that. And so I think you start to see the complexity uh, of a conflict just in North Korea, and I think it makes the point, uh, as well as violent extremism, that the conflicts that we are going to confront today very quickly, very quickly become transregional and multi-domain. And so in that context, I, I personally don't believe that our current planning our organizational constructs or our command and control are optimized for the current fight. And I think the chief mentioned to me earlier that, that you spoke about that a bit yesterday. Today, you know, our planning construct is actually focused on, on that regional strategy we had in the 1990s. And so today, if, if, we, if we buy into the assumption that any future conflict be transregional, multi-domain, it makes sense that our, our, stri our strategic framework would change, and we're working on that right now. Today, in, in operations, uh, as, as well as, as kind of planning regionally in, in execution, we rely on cooperation, collaboration, supported supporting relationships between combatant commanders. That, in my view, is not the same as integration. And so what really is required is global integration. And, uh, and if you think about it, the Secretary of Defense is the lowest level of integration in the department across the com combatant commanders from an authority's perspective. And for that reason, we're going to do a couple of things to, to address this. First, this year's national military strategy, for the first time in, in many years, will be a classified document. And the intent is to build a framework within which we can address these four plus one challenges and the many domain, the, the, the five domains that we are dealing with and the many functions associated with that, so that we really have thought through not just from policy to specific operations plans, but truly step back at the strategic level in between policy and operations plans provided a strategic framework. One of the things I've said to the staff many times is the aggregation of operations plans isn't necessarily a strategy. And that'll be very unsatisfying if you go back to what I said was one of the key deliverables of the joint force, which is to deliver viable options to our national command authority in the event of a crisis or conflict. Pulling an old plan off the shelf will be an unsatisfying exercise at zero one when the enemy does something exactly not related to the old plan that you have spent so much blood, sweat, and tears developing. And from my perspective, you go back to, and I think it was George Marshall, but somebody once said, and it's, it's wise words nonetheless, that you know, the value of plans is in the planning. And so by expanding the way that we develop our approach to the Russia's, China's, Iran, and North Korea, the idea really is to expand the intellectual capital that we're expending on those problems, expand our thinking, 
and open up the aperture to the options that might be available to our national command authority in a crisis. And without going into great detail, we're also taking a hard look at our command and control and we'll be moving forward in a way that allows us to provide the Secretary of Defense with a better ability to, uh, to command and control and to integrate the joint force. And just as an aside, sometimes when I talk about command and control for the joint force, people start to twitch and they start to envision large screens with blue force trackers and now the Secretary of Defense is going gonna, is gonna to be paying attention to all of the, of, the, uh, of the icons on the wall and that's command and control. No, command and control is making sure the Secretary of Defense has a common understanding of the fight with the combatant commanders. Command and control is a, is a dialogue that takes place between commanders and the Secretary so that when he has to make decisions in a timely manner, he has what I describe as the court sense necessary to make those decisions quickly and effectively. That's, that's what command and control is, and I would focus more on the command word than the control word uh, when I had that discussion. They're not synonymous. They're two separate words. And so, uh, you know, I have found the first few times I spoke about this, people started again to get nervous, and they said, oh, we're, when we talk about global integration, we're talking about now micromanagement of the Secretary of Defense is going to start to move tactical formations on the map. No. What, what I'm speaking about now is if you can imagine that Korea scenario I mentioned, and who believes that that would be happening in isolation in the world uh, for the United States. And so when the Secretary convenes, uh, you know, his commanders, and he's got them all up on the screen, Today, what he would have is a cacophony of voices all sharing their perspective from the Pacific Command, from the Northern Command, from Cyber Command, Stratcom, European Command, AFRICOM. And they're all asking him to make decisions, and they're all providing him input. And what I'm suggesting to you is, given the speed of war, given the change character war in the 21st century, that's not going to set our National Command Authority up for success. And so we're, that we're really, as a matter of priority, in addition to providing a strategic framework within which we can address tomorrow's problems, we're really focused on command and control uh, as well. And now, maybe just to, to close out, just to share just a few comments about the Air Force. And, and from my perspective, this is not a news flash, but sitting where I sit, uh, the biggest challenge that the Secretary has, the biggest challenge the Chief has is that today, all of the legacy capability in the United States Air Force is, is required. We're asking for all of it. And we're actually, we actually have more requirements than you have inventory. And we're asking it to simultaneously transition to develop the capabilities that we need for tomorrow. That, you know, that's a pretty, pretty significant challenge. And, you know, of course, the F-35 and the A-10 are just one of many examples where you have that tension between trying to take a platform offline and use that headspace to grow new capability, uh, and, at, and at the same time, that, that legacy capability is required, and it's just hard to get there from there. We're also asking to modernize long-range strike capability in nuclear enterprise. At the same time, we're asking it to invest more in cyber and in space. So the next few years, uh, the Secretary, the Chief, the leadership are confronted by some pretty tough decisions. And I'm going to look for ways to help um, as the Secretary and the Chief, you know, reshape the Air Force as you fly. But the only advice I'd give you today uh, is the advice that I, that I kind of share with my staff from time to time when you're trying to, when you're trying to solve problems. I say, hey, look, you can't afford to have any of the three Ps. You can't be parochial. You can't be possessive and you can't be pedantic. None of the three Ps, because that will be the quickest way for us to actually get it wrong. And, and, you know, when you think about it, I think it's fair to say airmen have always thrived by looking at tomorrow and not yesterday. And I don't think there's ever been a time when that kind of thinking has, has been more appropriate. So I'll close by telling you that I have absolute confidence that you're up to the challenge. And, and from my experience, airmen have always been driven by excellence. But Sometimes we think about uh, the Air Force, we think of hardware, there's also intangibles. And, and uh, came across a quote from uh, General Spots who, who said it best, he, you know, this gets at the intangibles. We considered ourselves a different breed. We flew through the air and other people walked on the ground. It was as simple as that. I'm a guy that spent my life walking on the ground, uh, and I, but I actually get that because what he was really saying is whether it's air, space, or cyber, you thrive where there is no precedent, and you step forward where there isn't any predecessor. You do that with pride, you do it with energy, you do it with effectiveness, and that's exactly what I know you'll do in the coming years. In the end, you're always going to find a way to fly, you're always going to find a way to fight, you're always going to find a way to win, and that's why I'm proud to be on the team with the United States Air Force. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks.
Thank you, sir, very much. We only have a few minutes, but I do have a number of questions here. Uh, during the course of our uh, conference here for the last couple of days, we've had a number of sessions talking about joint war fighting, of course. And when uh, General Goldfein spoke to us yesterday, he talked about the efforts of trying to expose Air Force officers and airmen in general to joint war fighting experiences earlier in their career to build them so that they can lead joint forces in the future. I know that the two previous chiefs also uh, spent a lot of time trying to uh, groom and grow joint leaders within the Air Force as well. But the question is, when we look at an operation like Inherent Resolve, which is almost exclusively air, the question would then be, um, why would that not be led by an airman? That's a, you know, since we only have, that's a pretty short answer. There's no reason why it wouldn't be led by an airman. I've spoken to the chief many times. The fact that it isn't led by an airman should not indicate to any of us that it couldn't be led by an airman. Uh, you know, in, in this case, the Secretary of Defense picked uh, the, uh, what he believed was the best available athlete for the job. The other, the other issue, uh, you know, and we're having a conversation about this, is that, you know, the United States Army has an organizational construct, the United States Army Corps. And so that was a kind of easy fix, easy sourcing solution. It had all the command and control capability and all the staff functions, and we could build a joint force around that. Uh, you know, as we looked at sustainable solutions, there are alternatives. There are alternatives to doing that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that another service has to replicate what an Army Corps brings, but we have talked about solutions that include building a staff, uh, you know, much like the staff that, frankly, I had at U.S. Forces Afghanistan or ISAF, which was a staff that would, would have a nucleus to make sure we have campaign continuity so you manage the assignments and you manage the the, the training piece to have a, a, a nucleus uh, of people flowing in and out, but you still, you know, can build a more joint command and control element, and, and we'll have that conversation in the coming months, and the, and the chief and I have had that conversation. Uh, you know, frankly, uh, the decision that we came to for the current uh, deployment was really based on time. We, we, uh, the good idea cutoff was about there, and, uh, and we, we have an effective solution that's in there right now. But if you assume like I do, that we're going to be in that region, if not in Iraq, for many, many years to come, then we do need to open up the aperture in terms of how we source these headquarters and the talent from which we draw to command. So I guess for the airmen in the crowd, I mean, and again, say this not to pander to the crowd, but, uh, but there is no reason uh, that an airman couldn't do it. And, uh, and quite frankly, I could name names of, of airmen who could do it, specifically individuals who could do it. So I don't have an issue with that. Well, thank you. And I, I when you talked about uh, parochialism, I was very careful about uh, uh, whether I should ask that question no, no. or not. But uh, look, <laughs> you know, I don't want to. You know, when I when I said that, you know, I I, I use those words. I mean, I I just because I th what you really need to do is if you're if you're, for example, a pilot and and you're starting to think about the, the relative ratio of manned and unmanned aircraft, well, it'd be natural, you know, for you to say, hey, we really need manned aircraft. If you're an infantry officer. You know, I couldn't imagine a Marine Infantry Battalion that wasn't 978 Marines with three mortars. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's you, you, what, what I'm suggesting is you've got to get that model out of your mind. I don't think there's anything wrong institutionally with, with looking out there at the joint force and looking at where airmen contribute to the joint force and uh, where they could contribute. But let me follow up, if, I, if you don't mind, because sure. there, is, there is something I would have fit into my remarks, but I just couldn't because of time. There is another area in the joint force where we need airmen, and frankly, it's building the capacity of air forces uh, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and many other locations. That, to me, is a core function of the United States Air Force. There's not a better air force in the world, and so my argument is there's not a better organization that can help us build air forces. I just want to share with you an anecdote. Uh, and I, I don't want to get him in trouble, but I, I went to visit. My nephew is, a, is an Air Force captain, and he's, he's out training in, in, uh, in Afghanistan right now. And didn't have him, but I grabbed three or four of the other officers that were in his organization on a recent visit to Kabul, and I said, hey, uh, is this a good deal for you? And they kind of looked down, and, you know, they didn't want to answer me directly. I said, uh, you know, I mean, is this good for you? I mean, is this something that's competitive that, that people really want to do? And is this, is this look favorably on in your career? And their perspective was no. 
And so all I, all I would ask you is to think about, you know, what's important and how do we incentivize that. And if our young captains think that maybe doing something like building the Afghan Air Force is not really something that makes them competitive and not something that's valued by the institution, that we won't get the right people to go. And if we don't get the right people to go, we won't grow the right Air Force. And our, our, uh, our strategy today is based on building effective indigenous forces. We cannot, we cannot be every place. We cannot do everything. And so the theory of the case is, is that by growing effective indigenous forces in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, with a relatively uh, modest investment, we can sustain the environment within which violent extremism, in this case, won't flourish. And so I, that's just a comment about, about what does the joint force need. And so now I've just added to the 53 things I mentioned earlier that we needed the Air Force to do. I just added another one. So, Chief, you're welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you, sir. Unfortunately, we're out of time now, and I want to thank you again for your uh, outstanding presentation. And I know how busy you are. Uh, to take the time to come talk to us really means a lot to us. Hey, before, but, I, before I leave, I just want to, I just, I'm, I'm actually pretty proud to do this today. You know, I went to, I was telling Scott earlier, I went to a very small school in Vermont, about 1,500 students, and the only ROTC that we had was Air Force ROTC. So I was in the Arnold Air Society for a while in 1973, and I'm going to send an email out to all my, uh, all my partners today that, uh, hey, I, I spoke to the Air Force Association today. What's more interesting is the ROTC captain instructor was a guy by the name of Captain Michael Hayden. So he's a, I got a picture of him in my, in my yearbook. So I might, I might actually tell him that I was here today, too, and feel pretty damn good about it. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, present, present, present.